We've got three readings this morning from Proverbs. The first one is chapter 6, verses 6 to 11. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. And our second reading is from chapter 24, verses 30 to 34. I went past the field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. Thorns had come up everywhere, the ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed, and learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. And our last reading is from chapter 26 in Proverbs, verses 13 to 16. A sluggard says, there's a lion in the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. As a door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns on his bed. A sluggard buries his hands in the dish. He is too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. A sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven people who answer discreetly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. Thanks, Beryl. Uh, if you heard a bit of the ramp up before we started, I was saying that um, Alan's given me the subject of work. And yet, if you notice in the passage, most of those verses are not so much about work, but about laziness. So uh, it'd be interesting to have a look at this, won't it? So this is the, um, the subject series we're on at the moment. So we're on to the third one, work. So we've got another three services left on this subject. And we're going to have a look at work. So the Bible has a lot to say about work. I realised when I started preparing and I just thought, gosh, I don't know how I'm going to fit all this in. So uh, we've got a kind of cut down version of what the Bible says about work. Now, I realise that there's lots of us in this room that for one reason or another do not work. So what I want you to think about is not discount yourself and say, well, this is not applicable to me. But think about it in terms of what we do around our homes, our families, voluntary work and ministry. So we can apply all these principles to the things that we do every day in our lives. So work is good for our physical and mental well-being. It gets us up and out of bed. It gives us a purpose and a sense of worth. Whatever job we do, whatever role we have, we can do to the best of our ability. It helps us focus on something other than ourselves. It takes up time in our brains so we can't obsess about worries, concerns, anxieties. A few months ago, um, I had a lot going on in my head. I was worried about stuff, I was concerned. Things that filled my thoughts. When I started working for church, I suddenly had two jobs, along with all the other responsibilities at home. And I've been so busy that I've not had time to dwell on all the things that were bothering me. I've just had to focus on getting through each day and doing what I needed to do. It's been good for my mental health. I probably wouldn't tell you that on a day-to-day basis when, I'm, when I've got this list of things to do in front of me. This is good for my mental health. I'm glad it's only for a season, but for this season, it's been good for my mental health. And so when we don't have enough activities to fill our time, it can lead to too much time to dwell on things and overthink Quality, character and ethics are foundational for our work. So how we work is, is, um, is as is important, I can't say that, is as important as doing the work itself. Do we do the best job that we can do? Or do we do the bare minimum to get by? Do we have good character, good timekeeping, reliability? Do we moan and complain and bring negativity Or do we have a good attitude towards our work and our co-workers, our boss or our subordinates? Are we honest? Do we demonstrate integrity? Are we kind? Are we compassionate? Are we fair? 
All of these things are part of our call as believers. Imagine being known as a Christian in the workplace and yet be gossiping, foul-mouthed, stirring up trouble, etc. Do we embarrass ourselves and Jesus by our behaviour? Are we bringing glory to him in our work? So as I look at these passages, there's a link between work and provision. In Luke 10, verse 7, Jesus says, A worker is worthy of his wage. There's a link between work and income. And I believe God has given each of us an ability that we can turn into paid work to be able to support ourselves and others. In the Proverbs 24 passage, the lazy person's got a vineyard. It's a resource, isn't it? A vineyard that you can use to grow food. And also wine, also useful. Doesn't, don't grow wine, let me make this clear. You grow grapes. Grapes can be eaten or drunk. Uh, it can provide work for some people. Grapes that can be sold for a profit and leftovers to provide for the poor and those unable to work. And so they've got this resource right here in front of them, but they're too lazy to tend anything and to use that provision for anyone's good. What a shame and what a waste. I want you to think about, do you have any ideas or passions or gifts that could possibly be used to create provision for yourself and others? I encourage you to explore them and see what you can do with what God has put in your hand. I read something interesting uh, yesterday. This isn't in my notes, but it's just come to my mind. And it was in a decluttering email. And it was talking about when, we, when we're children, we have these dreams about what we want to do. And then life kind of smothers those dreams. And then we start to fill up that space of our dreams with stuff. Or oh, I'll buy a new candle, or a new throw, or a nudie. And it'll make me feel better. And it's kind of taking the place of that vision and that purpose and those dreams that God's put in our hearts but it never really fulfills us. And so we end up with a house of stuff that we don't really need and we're still missing that kind of something out of our lives, that dream that God's put in our heart. Moving on, what about work addiction? There's a fine line to be found between being diligent in our work and becoming workaholics. I feel like I've slipped into this recently because of necessity and I'm hoping this season will come to an end soon. I think Charlotte only ever sees me with a laptop in front of me. Sometimes deadlines and work projects demand that we work stupid hours. But if that's our life, if that's all we ever do, we just constantly work, 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 then it's not good. We should make work a means to an end, not the end itself. Workaholism will cause us to Uh, neglect other things, our family, our friends, our exercise, good emotional and mental health. There should be a good work-life balance. The ante in the first passage is self-motivated, isn't it? It doesn't need someone to tell it to go to work and to provide for their future. They know that if the ant doesn't work, then there's going to be no food for the ant family and friends come winter. So there's activity in summer. You see them constantly. As soon as the weather gets warmer, the ants are out and they're looking for food and they're very organised and they just get on with it, don't they? But they work hard all summer to provide for the quieter seasons of winter when they aren't working. They work hard and then they rest. I'm in a season of work right now. I've got two demanding jobs, three children, a busy house to run. And it's exhausting and I feel permanently tired. And when I spoke on Sabbath rest a few months ago, I talked about how important it is to work from a place of rest and to have a rhythm of work and rest. And I don't have that right now, so I hold my hand up. Um, But I have this kind of feeling that, you know, I want to have a duvet day. I want to watch some films. I want to watch a period drama and read a book. And when I do that in the rhythm of work, it refreshes me. And I feel like I can go again. It's like a good Sunday afternoon with a Bond film or whatever it is on the settee with your blanket and your pyjamas and your cup of tea. But if I did that every day, I would feel tired and lethargic and bored. But it's good to mix it and to have a balance. Perhaps we should have called this uh, sermon balance (laughs) rather than work. It's funny that these passages about work focus on laziness. Now, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands to say, do you think you're lazy? Would you like to put your hand up and tell me? Because that would be really awkward and embarrassing. So we're not going to do that. But laziness is not looked upon favourably in this passage. It doesn't explicitly say it, but it's seen as foolishness. Proverbs are about the pursuit 
Of wisdom and the opposite of that is foolishness. Being a good worker is wise. It brings blessings to you and to those around you. Laziness is not a blessing. It puts strain on other people having to do your share. Sabbath rest is a gift from God, but it came after six days of working. It didn't, God didn't just chill out all week and call it Sabbath. He worked and then rested. Some of these proverbs are humorous, aren't they? The Proverbs 26, verse 14, as a door swings back and forth on its hinges, so the lazy person turns over in bed. It reminds me of that scene in Monsters, Inc., when the, it's a, the robot is lying in bed and he turns over as soon as the door opens. It's kind of that image of, you know, constantly just being in bed. Sleep is good. Sleep is a blessing. But it's not good to have as your primary occupation. Getting enough sleep is one of the best things that we can do for our bodies. It keeps us healthy. It gives us energy. It helps us lose weight. It heals and restores us. But then if we get too much sleep, guess how we feel? Tired, (laughs) lethargic. Personally, I get headaches. I get really bad migraines. Wisdom is found in getting the balance between making sure we get enough sleep and then not spending all day in bed. One of the key messages that came out of the COVID pandemic is to create comfort for ourselves and our family in our homes, to wrap ourselves up and protect ourselves. And it's resulted in many people cocooning themselves against discomfort. The problem is, is once you're in that kind of place, it's really hard to get out of it. Before I started coming back to church, I was enjoying sitting and watching church in my pyjamas, not having to get dressed, eating my breakfast, being relaxed, playing with Charlotte. And it's really hard to then get here and think, oh, it's going to be much better in church. But you know, as soon as I got here, that was it. I wanted to be here all the time. Because there's something special, isn't there? We're gathering together as a community of believers, being together and worshipping. It's lovely to see so many here this morning. But we can, we can become complacent, lazy. Our priorities change. We become insular. We come up with excuses for not stepping out of our cocoon. We've got family responsibilities, we're frightened, we want to protect ourselves, we have time constraints. And then we start to believe our own excuses and we we find ourselves trapped in that cocoon that we originally built ourselves for protection. It's suddenly become our jailer. I've often said that God is more concerned with our character than our comfort, but we seem to have become obsessed with our own comfort by making ourselves happy, treating ourselves because we're worth it. These messages come all the time, don't they? So when we start asking people to step outside of their comfort zone, they're reluctant. There's many pulls on us and we get stuck. And yet, when we face the fear and we step out of the boat, that's where the magic happens. Just think about all the people that have message, uh, volunteered for the message bus. You know, a lot of our volunteers are in, are in the 70s going out in the cold and the dark and mixing with teenagers by, by Jove. They face their fear and stepped out of the comfort zone. But I bet they've got more out of it than they've given. In the newsletter this week, I don't know whether you've already read it, plenty of time, I've got some at the back as well. Alan told this frustrating story of how there was no power and all these, th- all these challenges that they faced and the team prayed together and saw a miraculous provision and answer to prayer. And the result far outweighed the struggle. And I know many of the team, I haven't spoken to all of them, are still buzzing from seeing God at work so tangibly. And if they hadn't stepped out of the comfort zone, they wouldn't have experienced the blessing. There is a verse in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, that says, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Now, I give notices every week. I don't know if you've noticed. I'm here every week for all kinds of different things that we need help with. And I think sometimes we'll look at it and think, well, I I can't do that, or I could maybe do a bit of that, but I couldn't do the whole thing, or what if I start volunteering and then I can't get out and I hate it? We have all these fears and worries that cloud our minds. But if we step out in faith and give our time, even if we feel weak and unqualified, it gives us an opportunity to experience the mighty power of God. When we are weak, then he is strong. And if we never try to do things that we're not perfect at, we never see kind of God making up that that gap between what we can do or what we think we can do and what we actually achieve. In the end, we miss out on those blessings. 
You know, every month when the prayer meeting comes around in the evening, and those who are close to me will know I'm absolutely terrified. I lead worship on my own on the piano. I'm not an accomplished pianist. And I, I try my best with my faltering voice, and I just think, you know what, I'd rather just stay at home in my pyjamas with my blanket and my, my glass of Baileys and watch Call the Midwife. But every month I think, oh, I just can't, Alan will be disappointed, and Judith will be disappointed, and I'll be letting people down, so I'm going to go. And every month, God just turns up. He, he brings his present, and I always feel astonished. But if I didn't put myself in that position of fear and complete weakness and rubbishness, then I wouldn't see that provision of God's power. And God is waiting to use you in similar ways. You know, just because we're here looking confident doesn't mean that we actually are. You know, sometimes we're quaking in our boots and we've just been obedient. God calls us out of the boat, out of, out of our oversized fleecy blankets and hoodies to step out of faith and see what God will do for you. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared as our way of life. God's prepared works for each one of us to do. He gives us unique skills, gifts, talents, and calls to particular roles or activities. There's no hierarchy. There's no favoritism. There's no call that's better than somebody else's. We, there's no second-class calls from God. We're all needed we need leaders we need people to do mundane jobs and everything in between because how do we function as a body we need little toes and eyes and fingers and hearts when we put on this earth it's for a purpose and our purpose is it's usually tied in with kind of the things that we naturally like and our passion our desires our abilities and of course the primary purpose of every single believer is to share the good news of jesus is to make disciples, is to tell people about our faith. And every activity we do at church, whether it looks like it or not, is focused towards this purpose. The bigger picture is we want to see people know Jesus. We want to share that good news. We want to invite people into this family of believers. When we join in with the mission of the church, we're fulfilling our God-given purpose on earth. Our work should centre on service to others. When I first got this topic, I said to the guys uh, on Wednesday when we meet up to talk about it, and I said, what about if you retired? You know, how do we make this relevant to those who are retired? So I looked at retirement in the Bible, and the only reference to retirement is in Numbers 8, 24 to 26. The Lord said to Moses, this applies to the Levites. Men 25 years or old or more should come to take part in the work of the tent of meeting. But at the age of 50, they must retire from their regular service and work no longer. They minister to their brothers in the tent of meeting by keeping guard, but they shall do no service. Ooh, it'd be lovely to retire at 50, was my first thought. Four years to go. <laughs> but retirement's not really a thing in the Bible. You know, it's a very much a, quite a modern cultural thing for us. It wasn't a ceasing of work, more a change of activity. And the Levites switched from serving, to, from serving to serving and ministering to their brothers. So as with every church, we've got a core team of people, a core team of volunteers who seem to do everything. Every event you turn up to, it's the same people. And the majority of you are retired. And it's amazing to see, but people get tired and people get poorly. Like today, we've got lots of people who are off sick. And there aren't loads of people waiting in the wings to take over. But wouldn't it be wonderful if every single person that listens to this talk chooses one thing, just one thing, one group or activity to serve in, to share the work and to share the blessing that the service brings. Andy Mills, he's the co-chair of Theology of Work Project, says this, God's work multiplies through relationships and through the local church. We need to be in relationship with other followers of Christ to provide support and accountability. We should look for mentors and look to mentor others. We should commit to our local church body and help to bring the world of work into the church and the church into the world of work. There's an outcome to serving. I've put a few ideas on the screen, but there's probably more things that you could tell me about that you've experienced. When we discover our passion, 
And if you need help to discover your passion, come and speak to somebody. Don't just sit there going, I don't have any gifts or skills or anything to offer. That is not true. Simply not true. When we discover our passion and we use it in the service of Jesus, it has so many benefits for us as individuals, as the church, and as a community. Cayman spoke last week about friendship. In order to make friends, we need to be friends. And the best way I've found of making friends is to serve on a team, especially in mission. There's something so powerful about working together for a purpose. We meet people with shared interests and shared passions And we have time to develop these friendships while we are serving God and using the gifts that he's given us. It gives us a purpose, a reason to get up, a reason to live even. Even. These friendships then support us when we're low. They help us to keep coming to church. They help us to do social things. There's somebody to rely on when uh, when the chips are down. Serving also results in unspeakable joy, in fulfilment, in satisfaction in a sense of purpose, in contentment, and allows us to experience God's provision and God's blessing. And finally, and you all go, I just want to encourage every single person, whether you're in church or listening on the live stream, step out of your comfort zone. Step out of the boat, look to Jesus, say, what can I do to serve? I want to experience that blessing. I want to experience your power. And just volunteer to serve in one way. This isn't a big recruitment drive. This is looking at a passage. I don't want anybody sitting there going, oh, they're just trying to get us to help. Well, actually, yes, we are. Volunteer, volunteer. (laughs) But pray. Pray about the whole subjects of work and serving and ask the Lord if you need balance in any of these areas. Nobody's pointing the finger. It's about us and God. It's about our relationship with God and it's about finding our place in this world. Why am I here? What is my purpose? Work is a gift from God. We should always acknowledge that work and serving is a gift from God and thank him for it.